Hi, I'm Tara Schaefer, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh, and today's already our co-host, Chris McSpee and Matt Bingle. How are you guys doing? Good. good, Jakey. Doing very good. That's great to hear. I am, I'm doing great as always. Matt, nice. what do we have for today? Yes, first of all, welcome everybody. Glad you're with us. Uh, our special guest today was a human cast member on Sesame Street. From 1993 to 1995, he portrayed Jamal... No, for the record, not the one puppeteered by our dear friend Brandon Smith. That's an entirely yeah. different Jamal for those. Yes. For those for those who have seen uh Wes's first barbershop haircut, you know what I'm talking about. This is the human Jamal from the Around the Corner segments on Sesame Street, as well as producing and writing some TV and film work with his own company, Papaya Creative LLC. Gotta put that LLC in there, of course. Here he is, Juju Papaya. Welcome. How you doing? I'm well, thank you. I'm well. Glad to be here. Thank honored to be on the show. Oh, we're awesome. happy to have you. Yes. Happy to have you here. Very happy to have you here. So yeah. we know so we know who you are, and I kind of did, but in your own words, <laughs> would you care to introduce yourself a little bit? Wow. Uh yeah, so I'm Juju Papaye, and uh I was raised in Louisville, Kentucky. And I ended up getting into show business after um, being discovered on a a national drug-free America commercial while I was a dairy tech waiting to take my MCAT. So totally different than what I had planned and definitely to my father's dismay. But uh, that took me down the path of entertainment, and that's how I ended up uh, on Sesame Street, and then uh, been able to do some very cool things since. Nice, that's, that's great. Nice. Awesome. So, so what was your uh, background like, and how did you grow up? Well, um, so I, you know, um, I mean, as a kid, I have to say I was heavily influenced by two amazing parents, so mom sang opera and my dad had been an ambassador and then he came over in exile and and was a professor um so i had two very dynamic people in my life um i think because of my mom and dad dad was an amazing storyteller uh i i knew how to hold a stage i knew how to speak in front of people um Dad spoke five different languages, so I I was really good with hearing. So I got involved with uh, music early, and so then I had you know I had my mom and my dad with so that helped with the language of music um, and helped to to hear things. I can imitate pretty well when it comes to languages. I don't I'm not so fluent, but I can uh, pretty clearly articulate the you know the the speech pattern or whatever. Um, anyway, so I grew up with them. And uh, I was really into soccer, uh, loved soccer. Um, I ended up, a lot of things kind of fell in my lap in my life. So it was just the right timing, I guess. I ended up playing on a soccer team that represented the United States and France when I was 14. Wow. Like, wow. Yet, which was incredible. Hmm. And uh, our teams got killed, except for my team. So every team got killed, uh, blown away in the tournament. But we happened to come in second place. And I happened to score the most goals and be MVP. So at that eight, and and, and another incredible thing that happened, um, while we were there, there was a guy who was a former French national soccer player. And uh, he said, you know, if I came back after high school, I could try out for their team for the French team. Um, but anyway, I didn't. But I ended up setting a record at a high school here called Fern Creek High School that lasted for over 20 years, a scoring record, which was really cool. 
I played um, college soccer a little bit, but I ended up quitting for a lot of different reasons. And then I had all this extra free time, and that's how I got involved in uh, in in acting. Nice. Nice. <laughs> See, I find it, they speak and they said about play soccer. I actually play soccer. So oh, okay. What position? I, I usually play defense. Nice. So nice. That's awesome. Soccer is a great, awesome. a great sport, and it's growing so much. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Yeah. You know, speaking of you know, acting, how did you get into it? Well, I would say church, but the truth is, my dad used to play this sound this song called my hometown or my old town something like that it was a uh, i think it was bing crosby he used to play this oh. song and i would at the very end it does this thing with music where it just kind of seems like it goes around and around and around and i would like mm -hmm. perform i'd like at the end i'd like i guess lip sync and then when it got to that part i'd i'd turn around and around and around and then i'd fall down like, I don't know, I must have been like six or seven or something. And my <laughs> dad would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And I think that probably was the beginning of me going, hey, you know, I can make people feel good. Um, I have the power to make people feel good by performing. And that's probably, it probably started there. More formally, I'd say church. But I would, I think, I think that's how I got started. And then, like I said, my mom was a, uh, she sang opera and my dad, he was just a big man. So I think I was, I mean, big as in, you know, just his presence. And I think, uh, so I, I, I think I just emulated them sometimes. That's so, that's probably what got me into it. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Very nice. So who were your, some, who were some of your biggest acting influences? Yeah, so I grew up um, watching people like uh, Sidney Poitier. Um, it was probably my biggest, the biggest, the first biggest one. I am, um, you know, my dad was from Haiti, so I'm part Caribbean. And I think watching Poitier, there was some familiarity. He reminded me of my dad, you know, um, the way he spoke and his, his, uh, uh attitude a little bit and so yeah i think he and then after you know it's always funny when, i mean not funny but uh uh you, you you kind of cringe when you have to say it for obvious reasons but uh bill cosby was another uh you know oh, yeah. Yeah. way before we knew about um the the things that would lead to scandal for him but uh absolutely he was another one i looked at uh, you know what? Also, um, James Bond, I got to say, Roger Moore back in the day. Like, mm, the, yes. The, mm, James yes. Bond, everybody. I mean, God, those movies were just so incredible. And then on the funny side with Cosby was Peter Sellers. So mm. uh, the Pink Panther. So so anyway, those, uh, I th I'm sure there were some child stars too, but but I think I looked at the the older ones and they, they were really the biggest influences when it came to... Uh, to wanting to act nice oh you know what i gotta say uh escape to witch mountain there was all these witch mountain movies and mm. they were kids and uh they wanted they made me want to act too for sure there would have been my contemporaries maybe even a little young uh, maybe i was even a little younger but uh the kids on it on the witch mountain series they that was and of course tv the brady bunch and all that yeah for sure oh yeah of course, love the Brady Bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yes. So, do you remember your very first acting job? Um, I uh, acting job. Um, you know, um, I I'm sure it was a play. I don't I don't remember it exactly. I'm sure it was a play, and it was probably a church play. Um, I will say, the first semi-professional job um was the kentucky fried chicken training film that i did they we would uh i was in college and it was it was incredible you could do a commercial i mean a, a training film for kentucky fried chicken over the weekend and make like 400 dollars. like which back then was oh. you know a lot of money even now it's kind of cool to make 400 dollars for uh, a training film but that was probably the first uh professional 
a semi-professional gig. And then after that, commercials, um, as far as uh, film went, because you know, they were all films back in the day. Right. Yeah. Right. So now um, on, on to Sesame Street, you kind of mentioned a bit in the beginning um, how you got to Sesame Street. But what was the audition process of uh, getting Jamal like? Well, I, I'm going to give you the, I'll give you the full story. There was really um, an incredible kind of um, set of happenstance. Like I said, things kind of fell in my lap for many years. Um, so I was working in a dairy lab and, um, I had kind of stretched the truth to my, we had an agent in, in Louisville. Um, and back then even to have an agent was like, it just was kind of a joke, right? We just didn't have any kind of industry, but, um, she, she was representing me for commercials mostly. And uh they they said that there was going to be this drug free america commercial and they were going to use louisvillians for background right and so she's like ah you should audition okay so she said can you make the audition time and i said yes i didn't know if i could because if you are a dairy lab technician you have to wait till every milk truck comes in like you have to test the milk uh, you have to make sure they haven't watered it down. You have to make sure it doesn't have the wrong uh, and too much, too many antibodies on it or or bacteria, whatever, right? You have to. And every once in a while, a, tray, a, a, a truck would be late. And if it's late, you just stay. I didn't know if that's going to happen or not. Well, lo and behold, the truck ends up being late. This is for four cell phones. I know you all can't imagine the time for cell phones. This is for <laughs> four cell phones. And... Uh, my agent's calling the landline in the dairy lab, you know, and she's like, where are you? They're waiting on you. And these guys, you know, this, these people were from New York, right? So just big time compared to us, you know, and, and, and where are you? And you were supposed to be there, you know, 10 minutes ago, oh, I'm on my way. You know, I just kept lying. And finally rush over there. I get to, um, the audition and to prove that I wasn't lying, I wore my lab coat. Right? So, um, they had auditioned people in New York, Chicago, and LA. So I'm the last person in the nation to audition for this commercial, wearing a lab coat and late. So I'm going to make an impression one way or the other, which ended up working for me, right? So I get there. The woman, her name is Jane Stewart, and she was a producer, and she's pissed. Like She's just, she can't believe this Louisvillian is going to hold them up, right? And um, she hands me the sides. And she comes back literally within a minute and she goes, are you ready? Cause she just was angry with me. And I, for some reason I had memorized it. Right. And I go, yeah. So I do it. I do the, the audition and you always know as an actor when they like you cause their demeanor changes. She all of a sudden she goes from frowning to really beaming. Like she's smiling. She looks over at the director, Michael, Michael, uh, anyway, something and she looks at michael and uh and he like just moves over in front of her he goes and it became like hollywood okay juju i want you to do it again but this time when you do it um throw the this ball in the air and then drop it and then do a take to the camera like you lost your concentration because of reefer they were calling it reefer back then right so um so i do that and they're like okay ended up being um asked to feature in the commercial now they want you know they want you to be the lead my agent calls me and she's in disbelief she goes uh juju uh, they want you for the lead like because she didn't really think i was great <laughs> so she was in disbelief um and I'm like okay but we get there and they had decided to go younger and i was too old so they're like i'm so sorry but we'll feature you in the commercial first kid who goes up there it's 90 something takes they went with an eight-year-old and a 14-year-old. 90-something takes, and that was when it was $100 a foot on film. Like, So the director's losing his mind. Last take oh. of the day, I'm uh, talking to the mother of the kid who's up there, the 14-year-old. And she's like, you know, if you come to New York, I'll introduce you to his manager. And I'm I'm thinking I'm going to go to med school. I'm not, it's not going to happen. But I'm just going, okay, thanks. The director goes, cut, because the kid's on take... 40 something and he's it's the last take of the day he's lost his mind and he goes juju get over here you're going to put on an apron and do this bit so i do it um, you know apologize to the mom i'll be there and 
I do it in a few takes and he goes, now that's the way it's done. I, I don't know what's happened. Okay, did I just get the role? Did I take this kid's role? What happened? So I feel my hand being squeezed and it's Jane Stewart. And she's like, come here, come here. That's all she's saying. She pulls me into a trailer, shoves a card in my hand and says, what are you doing in Louisville? Come to New York, I'll manage your career. I leave, to my dad's dismay, I go to New York and my third audition with another agent who just was like, he's pretty good, but you know, he's green. If you get something, we'll sign him is with Sesame Street. So five callbacks later, all this to set you all up for this answer. Five callbacks later, I'm on the show. Again, it's well, fell out of the sky. It never happens. Your third audition with an agent who doesn't even like you, like it takes people years to get on the show, on shows usually, right? Um, the audition process and the last audition I was, uh, I was um, on NyQuil or something because I had the flu. Like I, I had the flu for that last audition. Um, and you had to sing, you had to dance, um, and you had to to memorize some uh, sides. And I think you had to do like uh, sing, sing a song. You had to I had to learn the la 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 la. I had to learn that and a few other songs. Yeah. Um, the guy who played Joey Monster was there, which was really cool. You know, like so they you actually worked with Muppets on the audition, and they actually came to my apartment. I don't know why. It's really weird. Yeah, that. I think that last audition they came to my apartment. I was I was sick. Um but yeah, I just it, that's that's how it happened. It just just fell out of the sky. Awesome. Wow. That's 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 wow. Yeah, <laughs> from no. like from a someone be like, oh, I'm not sure that's good, but then you know, never give up, you know, no matter yeah. what you know people say, just just don't give up all your dreams. And yeah. um and the producer you're talking about, are you talking about Michael Lowe, man? Uh, well, no, Michael was from the, um, there was a, yeah, Michael Loman for Sesame Street. Yes. But Michael yeah. was actually for the drug free America commercial. He was another Michael. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I got that makes sense now. Yeah. So, you know, before getting to, you know, work on Sesame, what was your fam fam familiarity with, with the show? Oh, please. I mean. I guess everybody grew up on that show, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was weird because I grew up watching Gordon and Susan and Luis and uh, Maria, you know, and Big Bird and, and, and uh, Snuffleupagus. And I grew up watching all these people. This was pre Elmo. And right. So and that's when Big Bird still, you know, yeah. Big, you know? yeah. And, and then to, to get on the show and to be working with them was just, it was it was surreal. It was really really kind of strange, man. <laughs> but in a way. yeah, I can tell. Yeah, right. right. Jiggy, what do, Jiggy, what do you mean big? He's always been eight feet tall. Like, yeah. what do you mean? I know. He's yeah. always been eight feet tall. Well, and yeah. you all know because because you're puppeteers. But you know his he uses his hand for the beak, so mm -hmm. he, that's why you know he's so so tall. But I know. Uh, right, yeah. I mean, you know, and he had to learn to skate backwards because he's looking at a camera and then the, the image, is, image is reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he said he he tells a story. Have you had Carol Spinney on? No, no, okay. um, well, no, he, that, did, that, he wouldn't no. mind. This. He, he, he tells a story that um, so it was they fired him after the, the first year. I don't know if you all knew that. <laughs> no. They thought really? they could, they thought they could replace him, um, and so they just were like, "Yeah, we don't need you know this guy," and um, and they had to <laughs> they had to beg him back and pay him more, you know. So anyway, but yeah, because they replaced him. But he said he the reason the way he knew it was a hit was that he was somewhere out in California because you know it's shot in or it was shot in Kaufman Astoria Studios in 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 Queens, and uh, he was in California and he's walking down the street. And behind a fence, I think it was like a wooden fence, so they couldn't see out. He says he hears two kids saying, I'm Big Bird. No, I'm Big Bird. It's what he said. He's hearing this. And then he says, no, I'm Big Bird, you know, in his voice, like in the real voice. And he said they got really quiet. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> <laughs> he said, 
But that's how he knew it was a hit. That's that's the only way he knew. He's like, oh, oh yeah, this is this is a hit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So, what was your first day like getting to work with the rest of the cast and crew for the first time? Well, so so they're they're kind of two first days. So the actual first bit I did on the show was a um, the twenty fifth anniversary special. Mm. oh yeah yes we did that in central park and um so it was very different than like just being on the show mm -hmm. you had uh all these people around you and uh gosh uh i'm trying to think of that uh i could see his name but anyway you had this singers group that he had brought from africa uh to work with him um it was a paul simon anyway but uh they were there uh the whole cast was there and some other special guests and we were singing these songs in the park it's so cool um oh, wow and so that was the first the first one so that was just different it was like that was like shooting a movie and i had done like i don't know i'd done some short films or something that were not professional but so i kind of that was i was kind of used to but but the first day on set in the studio was was actually scary for me um i had taken some soap opera classes this is so funny i'd taken some soap opera like acting classes right mm. <laughs> so yeah when it comes time for uh my first gig uh on the show it's with uh the guy who played joey monster mm. uh, it was with uh kevin clash you know it was him it was joey monster and elmo and me and I'm in the park and, and it was a bit about not picking the flowers, right? So I was supposed to tell him, don't pick the flowers because other kids won't be able to see and smell the flowers that you love. But instead of just doing it naturally, I was like a soap opera acting it. And I was just totally making it too dramatic. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> and it's like the director, so the director tells them to loosen me up. They, I didn't know. But he, the director says, hey, loosen him up, you know. So I was very strict religious Christian at the time, okay? Mm -hmm. They didn't know that. So they start telling dirty jokes in character. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I'm getting tighter and tighter and tighter. <laughs> it was hilarious. They didn't, they, again, they didn't know. But just imagine Elmo. Telling a dirty joke. <laughs> yeah. Even before you said the whole story about what happened, I already, already pictured myself that it's going to be something know, that yeah, happened. Right. It was, it was going to be something. Yeah. That wasn't, but that, but oh, that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's not but, a lot of moments like that in, like in Sesame now. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, but, but I mean, I got through it, but but it was tough that first episode. <laughs> I, I can't tell. Forget that day. No. So on the on the subject of uh episodes, do you have any favorite episodes you were in? Wow. Um, you know, I I there are a few that were really cool. I think dancing with um Roscoe Ormon, we played uh Ormond, we played um it was I don't know what it was even that but it was kind of like we were uh, some kind of soul group and we had these blue like suits that were i don't know like throwback and um the woman who played my wife angel jamat who became angela on the show um just a, she was an amazing singer and she had toured with different groups you know and so i think they kind of built it around her and so she's singing and then Roscoe and I are in the background just doing this like doo-wop moves. And um, that was really cool. Um, but for some reason, what one of them that really stands out was uh, an episode where my Angel and I were in the park with Oscar. And um, Oscar and Grungetta, I think that's who it was, mm -hmm. uh, his girlfriend. Uh -huh. And... Uh, they were talking about ants. It, 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 we, we were having a picnic and um, he kept talking about ants. And apparently, I guess he brought ants and was dumping them. And uh, 
anyway, that was just a fun, it was just a fun episode. Anyway, so I think those, those are a couple of the ones I remember that were, that were really fun. A, a lot of, a lot of fun um, episodes. Another one where um, Big Bird um, and I play a joke. It's actually kind of like that. It's probably where he took it from. Um, I was sitting with Angel and I was doing impressions, bad impressions. Like I was pretending to be Oscar, but I, you know, made it like really urban and ethnic. And she's like, "That is not Oscar." And um, and then okay, well, let me try another one. And Big Bird was like behind us, and I and mouthed it, and he did it. And, and you know, anyway, that was another real fun episode. She's like, "Oh my gosh, that was good!" And you know, and the joke was on her. Um, so yeah, that that one was another really fun. And you know, I'll I'll give you this. My favorite person to work with was, was Carol Spinney. He, uh, and of course he's Oscar and his alter ego, the Grouch. Uh, I mean, he's Oscar and Big Bird. Um, and he was just so warm and so welcoming. Just an incredible guy, you know, from the beginning. Uh, well, uh, Carol will definitely be missed, as well as Emilio um, and Bob, who we recently lost. Absolutely. So... You brought this up earlier. You also got to be in some of the Sesame Street specials. One of them being your first, it's the twenty fifth anniversary special. Yes. yes, for those watching on video, this is a VHS tape, folks. We're going way back on yes. this. What was it like working on that special? Um, I mean, there were a lot of moving parts. The, you know, I think, I think my first year. It's interesting you're bringing up stuff that I hadn't thought about. I think my first year, I always felt um, like I was trying to catch up to be as good as I was supposed to be. Like I just, uh, it, I, I, I felt like I belonged there, but barely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, mm -hmm. I felt like I needed to prove something, and I really needed to work hard. And and I think that first special is an example of that because. Um, you have so many moving parts. I had to know a song. I had to lip sync the song, you know, to a track that we had pre-recorded. And mm -hmm. I also had to hit my marks as an actor with all the movement where the camera is going to be. I had to hold the baby who was not mine. You know, because we had, uh, we would work with twins on the show. Right. Um, so I had to hold this baby for the first time. Um, and kind of bounce her on my knee while I sung the song, while I hit my mark, um, you know, and that was just a really great analogy for my first year on the show. Just like, ah, I gotta catch up, you know, and, and I'm not good enough yet. Um, so it was, it was, it was a challenge. It was fun, but I felt a lot of pressure for sure. Now I'm I'm curious. I know people have brought up this uh, this particular phrase before. Uh, when they were talking about like sesame and whatnot, uh, when you when you started working, did it ever feel like uh, that you got the feeling like I don't belong here? These people have been working here for years. Did, uh, did you ever feel that way your first year? Um, yeah, that's. I mean, I think the first year I definitely felt that. I think that um, it helped to have people who were welcoming. You know, I mean, like, you know, Savion Glover was awesome. Oh, um, yes. He was yes. awesome. Um, Gina and, and and Angela were awesome. Um, um, Ruth Buzzy was awesome. You know, we it helped to have people. Uh, Gordon, you know, Roscoe Ormond was, was, was really great to me as well. So I think it helped, even though I felt, and, and you know, I, I had been performing for years, even though I wasn't professionally performing. So you, so I still knew how to play it off, you know, like it, it, it's, especially by the second year it was, we were rolling, I was rolling, but the first year, I don't think people realized how much, um, how overwhelmed I felt. Um, but I did have, you know, I still had confidence, I still had an ego, I still had confidence, um, so I don't know if 
I would say I didn't feel like I belonged there. I just, I think I felt like, or that people were that much better. I think I felt like um, I just, I just had to come with it. You know, I, it just like, like in soccer, you know, when, when Jake's defending and some stars coming towards him, Jake's, he doesn't have time to think he doesn't belong on the field. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, hey, that's, that's at that true, time, yeah. you just do something or you don't, you know? Right. <laughs> you right. Or you don't. right. And, that, and that's, that's what I've done as an actor, you know, you, you just stepped up and I, you know, I gotta say, I was, I was blessed, man. I, it's another thing that like fell out of the sky. I mean, I had to audition for it, but I also at that time was training with Wynn Hanman and Wynn was Sanford Meisner's, Meisner's personal assistant. He taught Denzel. Uh, he worked with Morgan Freeman. He taught uh, John Leguizamo, um, um, Mira Servino, Paul Servino. Like he taught um, greats, greats. And um, so I was getting the training to help me around some of the things I, I lacked, right? Um, so I, I, I gotta say that I'm thankful for those experiences because, or for that training, because that helped me through the, the areas I was weak in, right? And that, that helped with the confidence too, because I mean, every week we would watch Emmy award winning, um, uh, Academy award winning scenes because everybody in the show, everybody in his class, everybody was working and they were Great actors. I mean, just talk about feeling out of place. Oh, give you a story about that. Um, I so I had to audition to get in. So I guess he's hearing it now. He I went to see him. He died during COVID. He was ninety six. Like like amazing man who who you know lasted oh. still teaching till he died. Uh, but went to his memorial. Anyway, um, he never knew this, or maybe he did. But you had to audition to get into the class and you needed a monologue. And I made up my own monologue and uh, because I couldn't find anything else. And I made up my own monologue. So I went in there and I did it. And at the end, he's like, he's like, that was good. He goes, what's that from? And I just like, (laughs) I don't even remember what it said, but I totally made up. I didn't expect him to ask me what it was from. And I made up something. So I'm lying to Win Hanman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who becomes like a second father to me. Okay, so that's how I got. So I get in. Well, um, months in to that class, I was just watching all these amazing actors and I was just feeling intimidated. And I, you know, I, I didn't do well when I felt intimidated. I was just feeling intimidated. It's like, gosh. And I started skipping class. And so one day before class, he calls me over in front of everybody. So like he sat at this table and with these chairs and and they were like bleachers. And then you'd have the stage. And he goes, Juju, uh, I'd like to talk to you. And I said, okay. And I go over there and loud enough for everybody to hear, he goes, I really want to work with you, but I don't, I don't understand your attendance. Hmm. And I'm embarrassed. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm sorry. And whatever, I, you know, tried to cover it. I sit back down. I'm humiliated. I sit back down, you know, in the back. And this this girl, Mara, Mara Stevens, she leans over to me and she goes, Juju, she goes, he really likes you. And I said, what? She goes, he never does that. And it changed my life. I was never late again. I never missed a class again. Um, just... That, you know, you talk about people who have influenced your acting. He he was just incredible. And he tricked me, tricked me into doing a one man or a two person show um, because I was writing music for he knew I wrote music. So and sang a little Mm -hmm. bit and I wrote music for this woman. Uh, It was a two person show. This is Spoon Bread and Strawberry Wine. And um, he said, you know. I, I, I'd like another, I'd like somebody who's, cause she was more of a model. He's like, I, I really want a real actor on the stage with her. He goes, would you, will you do it? And I was like, first, first he said, you know, will you write some music? That's how he got me to do it. I was like, oh yeah, no problem. I wrote music. And then, and then he like, you know, twisted my arm. It's like, I want you on stage with her. Will you do it? So he tricks me into my, my off Broadway show. Like, you know, <laughs> anyway, amazing man. Just, just uh, amazing man. Yeah. No, definitely. Oh, I got to tell you one more. And yeah. 
Yeah, yeah he, absolutely. Uh, he so he again he became like a like a dad, like a second father, right? So mm -hmm. I had been off for a couple of months because I was doing something I don't remember, maybe a movie or something. And I came back to class and um he or no 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 before class he he calls me to his office, you know, to the American Place Theater, uh, you know, 47th Street or something that's off Broadway and um, in Times Square. Uh, and he says, um, hey, Juju. Uh, oh, no, no. Yeah, he calls me. And he goes, he goes, hey, I want you to come to class a week early to meet your scene partner. I was like, oh, OK. Usually he didn't do that. Right. I was like, OK, this is weird. So I go and it's a longer story, but I go. And as I get there, my friends from class are like, hey, Juju, man, how you doing? Cool. And uh, this guy's like, have you seen your scene partner? <laughs> it's like, what? So he tried to hook me up. So he hooks me up with this girl, um, Paulette Braxton, and, you know, gorgeous. Um, and we became friends. I mean, it just, uh, we dated a little bit. But 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 anyway, the point is, amazing uh you know, man, and he really looked out for me. And uh, so many, you talk, you know, the show, you know, has a nostalgia title. And some of the reasons why, you know, I, I, I think when I think of nostalgia, I think of you, which you remembering times in your life, usually they're good times, but there are very strong feelings about those times. And when I think about the times with Win Handman, and in the American Place Theater, I just I'm very nostalgic. Like if you get a, it's a little sad too with there, but but just amazing, amazing man, and and amazing times, you know. So anyway, uh, definitely mm -hmm. for sure. So who were some of your favorite Muppets or human characters to do scenes with? So um, Carol Spinney, uh, who of course was Oscar and Big Bird, uh, absolute favorite absolute favorite um he just not only the consummate professional but there was a way about him that just he allowed you to to fail not not that i had many failures but like if like if you're gonna make a mistake or mess up on a line or something um he was just so loving and supportive and, and forgiving that he was he's the person you wanted uh to do that with and he i guess he i didn't know but i guess he wanted to work with me because you know there were like 10 writers and um and each writer kind of wrote for different people and so mm -hmm. the muppets could have uh, and 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 uh the muppets muppets could have influence on who they did scenes with or whatever and i think um you know he, i was one of the people he kind of chose to to mentor a little bit through it um not like we did we didn't really talk it wasn't like offset we would talk, but just on set, he was just awesome. So definitely Carol Spinney, definitely Big Bird and Oscar. I probably preferred Oscar to Big Bird just because he was more interesting in that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. probably because you never knew what he was gonna do. Um uh Elmo, of course, Kevin Clash, you know, the original. Um oh, yes. he he was working with El Elmo was just Incredible. And I'll say that the thing I came away with in the very beginning was that these are amazing actors. These these Muppeteers are amazing actors. What they could do with their hand, um, you know, uh, and with their arms uh, was just, I mean, so real. Ah, sorry. So um, it's the first year and Telly Monster. I, I also love doing scenes with him, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so Telly Monster is hanging back and you know we had a closed set but there were there were audience members right so mm -hmm. there was uh some five-year-old kid and this five-year-old kid wanted to meet tally and uh, and he says yeah sure and all of a sudden this five-year-old kid starts walking over to tally and the guy who played him and i'm panicked I'm like, oh my God, like the, the kid's going to see the adult, you know, and, and, and it's going to ruin this for the kid. And I mean, Jim Henson was a genius. I mean, the kid goes over, looks at 
the telly monster and just believes it's real. You know, oh, like, yeah. like just, it, he, of course, I guess he sees the adult there, but he, he's hypnotized by telly and uh, just incredible. I mean, you know, again, you know, what you all do is, is, is amazing. No, I, yeah. I love, I love telly. It's a shame. He's not really on the show too much these days. It would be nice to see more yeah. of telly. Mm -hmm. yeah. All it's right. Sure. We have a visitor. Yes, sir. yes, yes, we do. Hi, Marty. Hi. Uh, yeah, that's 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 kind of the magic we bring, you know. Uh, like like you said before we went on the air here, uh, he's been doing this almost exactly three years, and you know we did uh, we did uh, what did we do? We we did like a public appearance uh, at some national not not it's coming up, no that's not yet. Uh, some hot air balloon festival up in Pennsylvania about a year and a half ago. Okay. And I was. You know, it, it was our first time we had done this kind of thing. We got out in public. It was a huge hit. You know, people people weren't people weren't noticing him. They were noticing me. And there was a. Uh, I, I told the story on the program on previous episodes. Um, there was this. Uh, how old was this little kid? Probably about six or seven years old. Six or seven years old, and he just absolutely loved me. It was it was Aww. so it was so special, you know, and. Uh, yeah. it really was and that's that's what makes this so magical you yeah. know like like you mentioned like like you know you he's it's it's clear he's here yeah it's it's clear i'm here but they're more focused on me and that's what's so magical about it you know oh, yeah. it really is it really sure is. And, and what about for our human characters um for humans yeah so um of course angel because she she played my wife Oh yeah. Um, um, and then I mean, I had the most scenes with her, and I was supposed to be Gordon's cousin, so wow. I think I had it was, it was probably her, and then Gordon, I had the most scenes with. Working with uh, Selena, of course, was was great as oh, well. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Annette Kalud. She and let me tell you about Annette. So Annette, oh my God. She said, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm uh I'm 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 the I'm the understudy for uh somebody in Miss Saigon." And I said, "Oh, okay. I'd love to come see your show." So she goes, "Yeah, come see me." And so I went to see a matinee where she played uh I don't know that character, but whoever Miss Saigon was and the name, you know, the character and um she I mean, her voice was incredible, but she's like bawling, like real tears. Like, I mean, you know, it's a live musical, right? And this is on Broadway. Um, and I just was blown away. I mean, just talk about talent. I mean, Angel's amazing too, but 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 it's like, but they were a little different in in their abilities. Angel was more, um, you know, modern. Uh, soul and and pop and r&b but where uh annette as far as broadway music god she just uh, brought me to tears. i could not believe how talented she was um and i was like if this is a matinee who in the world could be better so it, not that you know like it'd be there's there's a lot i'm sure that goes into somebody becoming the lead for from for prime time um since not always talent, but just, 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 she was just incredible. I mean, we, that cast, <clears throat> we had um, Ruth Buzzy on there. Okay. So Ruth Buddy, Buzzy did this thing called a laugh aria. And mm -hmm. uh, she'd be the, oh, <laughs> you know, so it was like opera, but laughing. Um, incredible. Uh, and then, of course, Savion, you know, would come through and tap. Um, we just had, it was really, a really talented cast as far as humans as well. Yes, absolutely. You want to ask a question since you're here, Marty? Sure. Why not? All right, go for it. Uh, you mentioned celebrities. Do you, did you have any favorite celebrity guests to work with on Sesame Street? Well, you know, um, I, for some reason, I did not get to work with a lot of celebrities. Like, like. I would be there in the morning shift and they would become, so we had two shows a day. 
we'd have mm -hmm. like a show until lunch and then there'd be a break and then we'd have the afternoon show. And um, you might not be in both shows. You might be in one show. You might not be in any shows that week. They had paid you regardless, which was pretty cool. But like that was hmm. your contract. But I have to say my favorite uh, celebrity was Harry Belafonte. And oh, yes. Oh. Being in a special with Harry. And that he was, whew, I mean, next to, next to Sydney. I don't remember at that time. I probably was more of a fan of Harry just because, you know, he really reminded me of my dad. And, you know, oh. that, that, oh. that Deo song, uh, you know, we would, uh, we'd sing in the house, you know, so <laughs> just, just to think that I got that experience, you know, incredible. Ah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you, so you also got to perform with the rest of the Sesame cast in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. What was that experience like? Yeah, so the... <laughs> That taught me about about love. Um, oh. It was really, really bizarre. So we, the new characters, begged the the veterans. We begged, please, please let us do the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and they played with us because apparently they didn't want to do it. We didn't know. They're like, I don't know. I'm like, no, please, 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 let us go. <laughs> All right, all right, yeah, I guess you can go. So, you know, we learn this routine. <clears throat> we get ready, we're all excited, you know, because we went, I guess when you hit down wherever NBC is or whatever, they they found that's where they're going to broadcast it, your your uh, your number. So we're all excited. And, um, but we didn't count on the fact that it's Thanksgiving in New York City. Like, so it's cold. And it's like five in the morning. So we're there and it's, freezing we're like oh my god why did we volunteer to do this and we like we felt tricked we were like this is why they didn't want to do it and, you know um and we had to wear mittens it was so cold well so we're just like oh finally it starts moving because we practiced a little bit and finally it starts moving and we go down the first avenue and people start screaming for Sesame Street, like on both sides of the street from the building. <laughs> they're just screaming, going crazy. And we became so warm from the love. I mean, it's the only way I can explain it, that we had to take off our mittens. We had to take off clothes before that avenue was done. And there's no way it warmed up that much on Thanksgiving to where we'd have to take off, you know, mittens and, and coats and but it made me think, wow, that's that's the power of love. And Absolutely. and I, you know, and I wondered what it must be like to be at that time, like Michael Jackson or somebody to have, you know, 50,000, 100,000 people screaming for you. Like, yeah. that must have been just mind blowing because but that there's something there that can transfer through air. That's that's powerful. And and I'm, I'm I know that that love can. It, that was incredible. Ugh. And the, oh, and, the, and the good part about you humans is you don't have a five second delay. Oh, that's true. That's oh, true. Because yes. <laughs> we brought this on previous episodes. I don't know if you know about this, but the, the puppeteers in, inside, you know, they have the uh, um, the current float now uh, that yeah. they've had for what, yeah. almost 20 years. When uh, from the time you're in, like, like, can you demonstrate? Can you get out of the shot? <laughs> if you really want me to, I can. Say, uh, Say he's down here looking at the monitor on the screen. Just forget about the monitor because that's on a five second delay. Oh, yeah. Wow. It, it yeah. is on a it is on a yeah. five second delay. So you're so your best just not even looking at the monitor when you're live. At least with these guys anyway. You wow. humans are fine. You don't you don't care. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did not even think about that. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So now moving on from your time on Sesame Street, you mentioned earlier um, Spoon Bread and Strawberry Wine, which you starred in and also co-created. Uh, can you kind of talk about how that kind of came to play? Yeah. So uh, uh, Norma Jean Darden um, had written a book um, of recipes and Norma had been a model and she had been in Wynn's class uh, years before. And 
<laughs> and so she had this book called Spoon Bread and Strawberry Wine. And it kind of took, uh, it was kind of a food and like a history of food through her family, um, the history of her family and through their struggles being in the South. Like she was, you know, her family was black and uh, from slavery all the way through. Um, and it was, and it became like a hit book. And um, so she, they decided to do a one woman show. That's what it was going to be. And then um, when convinced me to write music for it, I was like, yeah, sure. I can write music for it. And then he was like, well, would you sing one song? Like, why don't you play her nephew and, and, uh, and sing a song? <clears throat> I said, okay. And then it became, you know, then I was, then I was, and then I ended up having more lines and became a, another character. Um, but, but yeah. And then at intermission, we would serve spoon bread to, uh, to the, to the audience, which was, which was really cool. And we did it off Broadway uh -huh. at, at the American place theater. And, uh, my, my favorite song and I haven't found it and I don't remember the words, but it was, it, it was about spoon, spoon bread and, I mean, but it was about strawberry wine. And if you, and if you learn the song, you could make strawberry wine. It was like, mash strawberries in a crock, add boiling water till it's hot, lemon juice, then stir with a spoon. Mmm, strawberry wine soon, strawberry wine soon. And it just kept going and I've forgotten the words. And I'm kicking myself. I've been I've been going back on. Oh my God, it's such a great song, and you could you could know how to sing, how to make strawberry wine, and I can't. I, I don't know what I did with the rest of that song. Oh, <laughs> that's what you know. This you know. I'm sure they taped it at some point, but this is the advantage you all have, your generation. There's always a record of it, right? Because right, of mm course, -hmm. there would have been somebody there who would have gotten that on a cell phone or or whatever and they would have uploaded it and then it's there forever but i i no it didn't happen unfortunately so i can't remember the rest of strawberry wine but it was a good song y'all <laughs> definitely so moving on to some of your, your film work you uh starred in the movie river runs red starring yeah. the wonderful tay diggs what was it like working on that movie um i you know uh it was very cool. Um, again, my life. I need to write a book. I'm glad we're 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 uh, being able to document this, give you a story. So uh, I had met the. So there's a producer here, who's made more films than anybody else. His name is Gil Holland, and Gil told me that there was a guy coming in town who was going to be shooting a Tay Diggs movie. And I should meet him because I had a script called Social Experiment, The Social Experiment. If we ever get it, then and you all will be able to, to recall, oh, he talked about that. Um, and so I met with the director because I wanted to shoot the film. And I was like, hey, will you read the script? I think maybe you can direct it. I don't care if I direct it or not. I'll just produce it and, and star in it. But... Uh, you know, since you're directing and you're you're getting Tay Diggs, then you could probably get this film done. He said, okay, well, I'll read it. So um, we meet to talk about it. And while we're talking, he just kind of looks at me and he goes, you act, right? I'm like, yeah. And he says, uh, well, there might be a role in the movie for you. I'm like, okay. I, I wasn't trying to act. Like I was trying to get my movie made, right? So I was like, Okay, like it's not like I'm ungrateful, but I that wasn't what I wanted, right? So mm -hmm. and and you know he, he's a director, and I've been in in and out of Hollywood for thirty plus years, so um, people can be full of it, right? So I didn't know whether to believe him or not. Okay, whatever. Well, about two weeks later, he calls me and he goes, "Hey, do you remember that role we talked about?" I said, yeah. He says, "Um, I want you to play the mayor." in this movie and i'm like oh okay awesome well uh i guess you should send me he goes and it shoots tomorrow your, your scenes shoot tomorrow i say okay uh yeah well, just send me the script now i'm thinking it's gonna be like a paragraph like there's no way this guy's gonna ask me to do some substantial role in a film opposite tay diggs 
without preparation. <laughs> okay. Um, but I get it in its pages and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, you know, um, mm -hmm. as, you know, as exciting as it is, it's also like, like overwhelming. Like there's no, and I had to teach an acting class that night. Like, that's the thing. I didn't even, like I told my students about it. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go home and, you know. It's six o'clock. You, you know, I'm, I'm going to go home and prep for this, um, this movie tomorrow with Tay Diggs. And uh, they're like, oh, okay, cool. And then I, you know, I get home and see the script. And so anyway, and I think we shot at 12 noon the next day. And this was like 10 o'clock when I started looking at the stuff. Um, thank God we shot it over two days. Um, and the second day I was much better. But um, it, it ended up, I ended up being one of the villain, one of the main villains in the movie. I get to yell at Tay Diggs, uh, which was cool. Um and, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun. He was very generous. You know, um, when you work with an actor, you all know about the reverse. You know, when you're doing the reverse where the camera's just on you, there may be, like, the actor doesn't have to stay there. The actor who who's reading with you. The, the director could just read it. Or the camera, you know, somebody else could just read it. The script supervisor could just read it, right? It's, right. it's So when you're dealing with stars, oftentimes the stars go because they're stars. But uh, he stayed and he's like, no, I'll read the lines to him. I mean, he was he was extremely generous and uh, and professional. And we had a good time. With him. So now you also I saw I saw on your uh, Facebook, you made your uh, first uh, children's music video, which uh, was sent to Michelle Obama. What, what, can you kind of talk a bit about what that uh, music video was? Yeah, um, there was a. Uh, there was a woman here um named jerry um amazing woman and she worked at at a at a nonprofit called louisville central community center and she wanted to do a fitness video um mm -hmm. and um she had a low budget and she's like you know i want to make a fitness video and i said well i said you know i'll i'll do the video for you but i don't I don't I don't think kids want to know while they're sit around and, and listen to something that tells them why they're overweight. Um, and she goes, well, what do they want? I go, well, they want to be like on MTV or, you know, BET or VH1, like you know, back in that back in that day. I was like, they want to be in a music video. She goes, OK, well, she didn't really quite get it. But she's like, uh, what do you think that looks like? And so we ended up I said, well, why don't we co-write with them this music video have them sing and rap and uh i'll bring in a professional choreographer and 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 we'll make it happen and um so we shot it and uh we showed it to jane Bashir at that time um um mayor uh, uh governor Bashir, as i call it, daddy Bashir, um because now we have baby Bashir um as the governor um but at that time it was the governor's wife and um and a few other i was on the kentucky film commission a few other kentucky film commissioners watched it and and jane really liked it and sent it to michelle obama uh they had oh. something called let's move uh, uh, uh anyway which which is cool didn't hear back so i don't know if she even saw it but um but it was sent <laughs> it was sent by our, our first lady to the country's first lady so that was cool. wow that, that started my company uh, Papaye Creative LLC. So that that wow. yeah, was the beginning of it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. So most recently you wrote, directed, and produced a drama TV pilot called By Design. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, By Design, um, we, it was really cool. We were, and this is, you spoke about this earlier, about never giving up. Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're still trying to make this movie called the social experiment right um there was a an investor who said he was going to give quite a bit of money to make the film um but months and months and months went by and he didn't do it so i i wrote down this was 29 2018 i wrote down what 2019 was going to be and it included investors and all of these all these dreams all these wishes that i wanted 
And um, from that came the thought, what can I make on my own without depending on other people's money? And I thought, well, you know, if I created a TV pilot and I made it a short, short pilot, like, you know, like Barry is only 20 something minutes, right? And which is an amazing show. But I was like, and The Office was only 20 minutes, right? I was like, what if I make it like around, around 30 minutes long? And what if we shoot it over a weekend plus a day or two? And what if I defer payments, right? What if I tell everybody, hey, listen, here's the idea. I don't have any money. But if you all will come in, we can all split the profits if if it hits. So that was the first thought. Um, and I reached out to the guy, Rolf Deakins, who wanted to, who I had targeted to do the social experiment. He was going to be the uh, my DP. And he's an international Emmy nominated DP and for a TV show called Tokyo Trial. And he's like, Juju, I just want to work with you. You know, you don't have to pay. So cool. And then I said, okay, well, now I had the confidence to enlist uh, a producer here, uh, Nathaniel uh, Spencer. And I asked him if he'd do it. He goes, Juju, let's just make it so cool. So then I reached out to three actresses in LA and I had worked with two of them and one of them, actually I knew all three of them, but I'd worked more intimately with two of them. And um, they said, we don't have to make money except for $125 a day because we have to we have to do it as union. And I said, okay, so now I needed a budget. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and miraculously, people started to invest. Once they heard the team I was building, then people started to invest. It was crazy. Like the train was moving and people started getting on board and we were able to shoot uh, by design um, in five days. And we uh, came in right under our budget. And, or well, it was a little over, but everyone was paid except me and my other producer and, and my cinematographer. Um, and we ended up winning uh, official selection at the Omni um, Cultural TV Festival in Hollywood. And we're four stars on Amazon. Uh, oh, nice. And, and yeah, it's like it, it, people still, like, it was weird. It was like 40 something people who just looked at, the site on our Facebook site and we, we haven't advertised in over a year, you know, so people are, people are still curious about the show. You know, we did a good job with it. Hopefully we'll be able to finish um, a season, but we need, we need some cash to do it. But anyway, yeah, that's what happened with that show. Nice. Awesome. Nice. Hey, right. so you mentioned starting your own companies, Popeye Creative, as well as the People Cam. Can uh, you talk? Can you talk a bit about your work with those companies? Yeah, so Popeye Creative um, is uh, the arts wing, right? So that's where I've been able to do children's films, um, commercials, uh, and and promos for for companies as well as the the tv show and i've got um i've got several pieces that are in development now several films and and tv shows that you know we're we're meeting with people to to get that done so that's Popeye. Nice. um two and a half years ago i was really afraid and and sickened by things that i felt were happening in in the country from all the unrest around unarmed people being shot to uh, the the uh, mass shootings, like what just happened in Allen, Texas. Yeah. Um, and I was scared, and I and I, I I felt like I didn't I shouldn't be scared in my own country. So I felt like either I'm gonna leave or I'm gonna do something about it. Like really, that's where I was. And so I thought, you know, if there were different functions to the app, but one was so you know, if first responders had a way to get live video um, based on the 
victims. And if the victims had a way to communicate in real time, then the first responders would be more informed and uh, more equipped to act. And the victims would be less soft targets, right? If they needed to organize away from the shooter, they could. Or if they had needed to organize towards the shooter, they could, but they'd be organized. And um, so that was the idea for for our app called SafeStream. Um, the PeopleCam LLC is the name of, of the company, but one of the DBAs in our first product is, is SafeStream. And it's a, a phone app and a dispatch portal that is essentially like 911 with video. So that's mm -hmm. that's uh, that's the people can. Nice. Nice. And you've also done some uh, public speaking at uh, All American Speakers. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So this is this is very new. So uh, which I'm honored uh, by them. They there's a little bit of a process to for you to be um, on added to their list. I've been added to their list. Um, I've spoken in front of thousands of people uh, over the years. Um, so this is an opportunity to, to do what I've done um, in small groups to, to larger groups, uh, but it's just beginning. So we, I haven't any gigs with them yet, but I am on their roster. So, hey, maybe somebody will see this. And if you're looking for motivational speaking or uh, a way to use acting techniques to, for public speaking, um, or even we do something called black, white, and blue, which is really cool. Um, and it's a way to bring together citizens and police um, by looking at the fact that for the first time in American history, we have uh, an unfortunate yet fortuitous opportunity. And that is that uh, blacks and whites in this country are both experiencing the drug ep epidemic at the same time and gun violence at the same time so you know we're amazing when we come together to fight against domestic and foreign terrorism and against natural uh, natural disasters so if we could look at this drug and gun problem as a natural disaster and come together and stop you know uh getting bogged down in our political differences yada yada um and work with the police and not uh, against the police or at least the good cops, right? Which most are, then um, we could overcome anything, you know, and that's, that's black, white, and blue. All that to say, uh, so those are, those are the types of things that I, that I uh, have set up to speak about. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. So besides your company, is there anything else you're working on that you can share? Um, really that's, that's, taken up all my time i mean the we you know are launching the app we've got uh neuro islamic school which is our first client and we're about to meet with some other people citywide and uh, across the country um that's taking quite a bit of time um and then uh the the film and tv stuff is kind of in a holding pattern but really most of my focus right now in time is spent on on the app so um i i is not really anything else i have in the works um i've i used to write all the time <clears throat> and now i'm i'm about executing the things i've written um i think some people just write and write and write and write and i'm like okay look i need to make this you know because i need to make these things and stop writing so i'm I'm definitely looking for opportunities to produce these uh, TV projects and films as well. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Very nice. Yes. So what would you like to say to those who supported the projects you've worked on over the years? Oh, gosh. Um, I, you know, I'm forever indebted and grateful for those people who have championed me, who've been in the corner, um, you know, I spoke briefly about Jane. Jane Stewart was incredible to to be there for me. Uh, she was my manager in New York. She was the one who uh, took me from Louisville to New York. Offered, you know, gave me that opportunity. Um, Jane 
and Marty Winkler. Um, he became, he was a manager as well. Um, I'm thankful to them. Judy Shane and associate. So many people, uh, Wynn Hanneman again, uh, Jerry Woods here. That was her last name. Um, B Boyd. Um, and, and I'm sure I'm, I'm leaving out people, but these were people who were just Karen Hunter was another one, just incredible people who stood in the gap for me and believed in me when I really didn't even believe in myself or, or you know, I, I, I guess I thought I was talented, but I really didn't believe in myself. And then, you know, I've got people who invested in by design. I mean, there's a lot of people I am, I'm extremely grateful for and thankful for that they saw something in me and, and, and opened up opportunities. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I thank you all for, for having me on. Yeah, yeah, oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, likewise. Likewise. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Likewise. So if people would like to connect with you, where can people find you? Yeah. So, you know, my name's uh, pretty easy. Um, there's only one of me apparently in the world. So if they do Juju Papaye on Instagram or Facebook, um, then they can find me. And, and yeah, you know, great to talk to anybody who's, who's uh, interested in, in this crazy career. <laughs> yeah, and, and the links will be in the description down below so people can yep. reach out to you. Follow yep. you. Yes, and the, um, since we're about to wrap up, so the last question that I'm about to ask is a question that we ask all of our guests at the end so um and we kind of touched up a bit on it earlier but so of course you know since this podcast is called jake's happy nostalgia show uh when you think of nostalgia what do you think of or how would in your own words how would you define the word nostalgia yeah i think nostalgia is a warm feeling um even a little melancholy about something some moments from your past um and that could be and and but your and your senses bring it about right so it could be olfactory you could smell uh some pie that reminds you of the way of, of a pie your grandma used to make or you could hear a song mm -hmm. that reminds you of your first love right uh so i think that's when i think of nostalgia that's that's what it means to me Definitely. Oh, great, great words awesome. Great words to end off. Thank you very yes. much for that. Juju, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This was fun. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. It's been yeah. a blast. And thank you so much for, for what you've done and be a part of our lives and keep up your great work. And can I, can I wait for what's what's next for you? Thanks. You yes. all got a great, a great show going. Sure. So. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, means thank you so yeah. much. It means a lot. It means a lot. It means a lot. I'll, right. I'll keep in touch and I'll let you know when this goes up. Yeah, please do. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Have you. Care. Have a great right. rest of day. Bye, Take care. Juju. Take care. That was fun, wasn't it, guys? Yes, it was. Yes. Very fun. Yes. I enjoyed oh. him a lot. It's great. Yes, check, but it's check his work. Uh, he's wonderful, right. and it's goodbye from us. Yep. Yes, yes it's, it's goodbye well. from us as well. And as always, what do we say, Jake? Keep nostalgia alive. See you next time from for lots of more episodes coming your way. See you next time, everyone. Next time. Bye -bye. Okay, bye, bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.